revitalizing to come to a symposium like this for me just to uh, understand that when we began, there was just one drug and now so many options. And uh, it was so easy to just say, we're happy to have something for you. And now it's confusing to say we have so many options that it's become uh, difficult to decipher what's the right way to go and what's the right path to go. And my uh, interest in this type of symposium is to bring the best and brightest to educate not just the patients, but to tell me how to take care of my patients on, on Monday and our patients uh, throughout uh, the upcoming months. And it's been wonderful to make the relationships like with Dr. Carvajal, who's the Director of Experimental Therapeutics and the Director of the Melanoma Service at Columbia. Um, so Rick, please come up and tell us about where we've gone with immunotherapy. Thank you. I'd like to thank Omid and uh, Dr. Piero for the, the really kind invitation. And I have to say, this is the first time I've stepped step foot in the Angeles Clinic. I've seen pictures, I've heard stories, but this, this is really a, a remarkable and magical place. So, so I'm really happy to be here. So in about 20 minutes, what I want to do is, is talk a little bit about some of the advances that we've made in the immunotherapy field for melanoma. As Dr. Hamid said, you know, the advances are coming along pretty quickly, um, and, and it is really challenging to try to figure out how do we integrate that? You know, what, what are the lessons we've learned? How do we take these new data? How do we talk to our patients about data? And how do you kind of um, take that into account when, when, you know, as a team, we're making decisions about your care? It's really complicated. Here are my disclosures. Um, and just, just, just in the way of background, this is kind of an interesting graph that I, I like to show that just shows kind of the, the lifetime risk of developing melanoma in the U.S. over time. You can see that it's, it's really increased pretty dramatically, I mean, more so than almost all cancers. And what I can say, you know, more recently, there's been kind of a flattening of that curve. And so we're not seeing the incidence in kind of the younger patients as much. Um, and so hopefully with prevention, sunscreen and so forth. Sorry about the feedback. I don't know if I, I should stand back. Yeah, um, you know, we'll continue to see a flattening and a decrease in the incidence. But if you look over the past five years, you know, there's been, you know, 9,000 or so more cases diagnosed um, that will be diagnosed this year versus like five years ago. Um, but also looking at those numbers on the upper right, Thankfully, even though we're diagnosing more cases, the number of people dying from this disease is going down. All right, that's, that's really, really important. And so why is that happening? Um, if you look at the kind of the far right, what I have here is um, the number of drugs that we have FDA approved for different subtypes of melanoma and, and other skin cancers. I want you to focus there on the right. You know, when I started doing this, when we all started doing this disease and treating this disease, we only had a couple of drugs approved. You know, we had chemotherapy, we had IL-2. Um, and so when we saw people in clinic with metastatic disease, uh, we didn't have a ton to offer. Um, and then really starting in 2011, there was just a dramatic explosion of new drugs being developed based on our understanding of um, the science, biology, immunology of melanoma. And so, you know, these advances, um, in part of what's or what have led to that improvement in terms of survival. Okay, and we'll talk about some of those advances. Um, Dr. Sullivan will be talking about some of the advances in targeted therapy. That's been a huge major component of what we've been able to do. I'll focus on immunotherapy. Like why, what is immunotherapy? Why is this important? And what are the changes that have been made? Um, it, it really is remarkable. When, when we talk about immunotherapy, what are we doing? right? It's not like chemotherapy or targeted therapy where we're saying, let's, let's kill the tumor cell itself, right? Let's just attack the cancer. Here, we're giving you drugs, substances, things that are going to change the way your body interacts with the tumor, right? And so as you can imagine, if your immune system was functioning appropriately, right, it would be able to recognize the, the foreign tumor, right? And just eradicate it. But the cancer is smart. They're going to figure out ways to kind of hide from the immune system, and so what we're trying to do is teach your body to kind of overcome those defenses. Um, and the immune system is really unique, right? In that it's very adaptable. Um, it's got something called memory, 
Um, and so if we teach our immune system to be able to recognize the melanoma, even as the melanoma changes, your immune system can adapt um, and, and create these really long lasting um, responses. Um, and, and that's why we think that immunotherapy, if we're talking about cure, that's our goal. Immunotherapy, um, you know, maybe is more likely to achieve that than some of our other therapies. So here are some of the critical questions that I think have been answered just over the past year or so. I can't really read that from here. So <laughs> yeah, and, and so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time going through these because I mean, there've been really um, key trials that have been completed recently that answered some of these questions. Um, and so the, the first one is, um, you know, we know that adjuvant therapy, that is treatment after surgery, resection of the melanoma, and, you know, if there's lymph node involvement, if we give you immunotherapy, we can reduce the, can the risk of the cancer coming back. Um, but there are definitely unknowns there, right? Like what happens in, in people with earlier stage disease, melanomas where the lymph nodes are not involved. You know, if, if I treat with, treat, if we treat you with immunotherapy, then will that be helpful? Um, and there's a trial called Keynote 716 that just reported that, that gives us some data. So I'll share some of that. Um, you know, one of the longstanding questions we've had in the field is, um, you know, for people who have melanoma that have a mutation in BRAF, so that's about 40, 50% of cases where we have the option of doing targeted therapy that worked very well or immunotherapy, we as a field have not known until recently, is it better to do immunotherapy first? or should we do targeted therapy first? Or frankly, should we do a combination? And so we have some data to answer that question. The third one um, is, you know, although we know that treatments like pembrolizumab, nivolumab, ipilimumab, these immunotherapies work really well, we need to be able to figure out how to make the immune system work better. And there are all these new immune targets that we've been looking at. One of those targets that, that's been of interest for a long time is something called LAG3. Um, and we have new data about targeting lag three. And then lastly, <laughs> for our patients for whom we treat with these anti-PD-1 antibodies, that's Keytruda, Optivo, you know, if the treatment stops working, what do we do then? And we have some data about that. And so just kind of moving on to that first topic, again, we know that um, immunotherapy, if we give it after surgery for lymph node positive disease, so these are stage, what we call stage three melanoma, or patients with metastatic disease after we, we cut out the sites of metastases, we know that if we give you therapy, that reduces the likelihood of the cancer coming back. Okay, so that's, that's well known. But what are the unknowns? Um, one, um, that immunotherapy, that adjuvant therapy will help some people, it won't help everyone, right? We only want to give it to the people who it's going to help. And, and I don't know, we don't know who those people are, one. Um, and two, what do we do uh, about earlier stages of disease? And so Keynote 716 um, was a trial where patients with stage two disease, no negative disease, right? There were two millimeters or deeper ulcerated and were randomized to either pembrolizumab or placebo, okay? Um, and I'm just gonna talk about that part one that's kind of there in red. An important part of this trial is part two. That is for the patients who are um, treated with the um, pembrolizumab or um, placebo, if the cancer comes back uh, and they're treated with um, Keytruda later, what happens? Okay, and that's, I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, the, the primary endpoint of this trial was um, recurrence-free survival, right? So we, we don't, you know, which drug is better at preventing the cancer from coming back? And as you can see on this curve, um, you know, the immunotherapy is the top line, that better line. And if you look at that 12 month improvement, you know, there's a very real improvement in one year recurrence free survival. And I think this is pretty compelling to tell us that it in fact does work. If, if I give you immunotherapy, no negative disease, I could reduce the risk of the cancer coming back. Um, but that comes at a cost, right? And that cost is, is the side effects. I, I think, you know, I suspect many of you are on immunotherapy um, and, and, you know, maybe have experienced some of these side effects. Um, some of these side effects are acute things like diarrhea, inflammation of the lungs that, you know, it's, um, you know, it's bad when you have it, we can usually fix it. Some of these side effects are um, kind of maybe not super severe, uh, but not insignificant. And that's kind of fatigue and joint aches and just not feeling well. Um, and then another class of side effects are these, what we call endocrinopathies, 
And these are the side effects where some of the hormone glands of the body are shut down. Um, and the, the issue with these is these side effects, if they happen, are permanent, right? If I shut down your thyroid fun function, you have to be on thyroid replacement therapy lifelong. Um, and, and so there's a certain kind of extra significance, I think, to this class of side effects. But on this trial, nearly 20% of patients treated with the immunotherapy developed these permanent side effects. Um, and so, you know, you know, what do we know? We know now that anti-PD-1 therapy in um, stage three disease, node positive disease, metastatic disease after a section works. Um, we know now that in high risk node negative disease, so now that's our, what we call our stage 2B and 2C patients, it also works. Um, but you know, what we don't know is, are those toxicities worth that potential benefit? Um, and I put this unknown because right now, I don't know if it's better, you know, to treat with adjuvant therapy now, which I know will reduce the risk of it coming back. Or, you know, if we say, let's watch you carefully, and if God forbid it comes back, you know, let's treat you then and potentially spare you the risk of those side effects. You know, the outcomes may be the same because we're now able to cure not everyone, but some people even with metastatic disease. Okay. And so, you know, part two of that um, keynote trial will, will help, help us answer that question. I want to shift to kind of metastatic disease. And, and this is kind of just a timeline of, um, you know, what treatments we had available and what we thought about treating people um, in the setting of metastatic disease, frontline therapies. And in, in 2010, you know, we had chemo, we had IL-2. Um, in 2011, um, you know, that's when we started to get the approvals of these targeted therapies and these immunotherapies. Um, and that's when we started um, really breaking down our management of patients into their kind of distinct molecular subtypes. Right. And, and there are a lot of molecular subtypes, but, you know, one of the bigger ones that we think about are, you know, are, are, do patients have a melanoma that has a BRAF mutation? Yes or no. Um, and for folks without a BRAF mutation in 2011, um, you know, we, we were treating with ipilimumab, that first immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, if you had a BRAF mutation, then you had the option of targeted therapy as well. Um, but you can see in 2013, um, you know, the, um, uh, there were further advances. Uh, we were using not just one targeted therapy, but combinations for BRAF mutant disease. Um, in 2014, we got the anti-PD-1 therapies approved. In 2015, we started looking at combination immunotherapy. Um, and, you know, in 2015, really what we had for a BRAF wild type disease was either um, ipilimumab plus nivolumab combination immunotherapy or single agent anti-PD-1. And for our BRAF mutant um, folks, we could do targeted therapy with a brf met combination. And again, if you go back there for the BRAF mutant patients, it, you know, until recently, it wasn't clear, do we do immunotherapy or do we do targeted therapy? Um, to help answer that question, there was a really you know, incredible trial that was called the DreamSeq trial. Uh, really challenging trial to do, but basically what this did was took patients who had a melanoma with a BRAF mutation that was metastatic and randomized them to either get immunotherapy or targeted therapy to try to help answer that question. Uh, and if the cancer grew, they would get the other, right? And so this, this is kind of the question, does sequence matter? Um, this is the data looking at uh, response rate. That is, what's the likelihood of shrinking the tumor? Um, and... Um, Let's look at the top part, the top two bars. Um, arm A, if you got immunotherapy, there was a really high response rate. We're talking 40, 50% response rate. And arm B, if you got targeted therapy, same thing, a really high response rate. What was interesting though, is if you got immunotherapy first, arm A, and then if the cancer grew, you got targeted therapy, that's arm C there. Um, the response rate to target was about the same, right? It didn't make the response any better. It didn't seem to make it any worse. If you got targeted therapy first, which is that arm B, and then at the time of progression switch to immunotherapy, that's arm D, it seemed like the responses were a little bit less robust, right? So from a tumor shrinkage standpoint, it seems that immunotherapy first may be better. Um, and then if you look at the other important endpoints, yeah, um, um, like you know, how long can we um, keep the disease under control? you know, clearly it's better if you get checkpoint blockade first. And so really, you know, our practice now for almost all patients is to do immunotherapy first, 
um, and then save uh, targeted therapy for next line. That's not going to be for all cases, so that's going to be true for the right answer for many, many people. Now, um, just, just a few months ago, we got another drug approved, which is a combination of relatlimab, relatlimab and nivolumab. And uh, relatlimab is a drug that blocks something called LAG3. It's another one of these immune checkpoints. And that LAG3 protein increases on the tumor, um, on the immune cells and cancers um, as the, um, cancer cell, the immune cells kind of tire out. And so we call it an exhaustion marker. If we block that LAG3 thing, uh, we can rejuvenate the immune system and it can function better. And so in the relativity trial, um, patients were randomized to either uh, the combination of what we say call RELA um, plus PD-1 versus PD-1 alone. And the, the primary endpoint here was disease control. If you look at the uh, tumor shrinkage rates, and it's really the top line there, um, about 43% of patients got major shrinkage if they got the combination versus about 32% for the single agent, suggesting the combination is better. And then if you look at a disease control, which is this progression-free survival endpoint, it's also better if you get the combination, okay? One of the outstanding questions in the field though is, you know, Rela and Nevo seems to be better than Nevo alone in terms of efficacy, um, but what does that mean when we compare it to Ipi Nevo? the other combination we tend to tend to use. Um, you know, and if you do these, what we call these cross trial comparisons, the efficacy still seems to be better for Ipinevo. We've got longer follow-up for Ipinevo. Um, and, you know, I, if there are questions from, from the group, I think all of this will answer a little bit differently. Um, you know, but the data in terms of what is the treatment that's likely, that gives us the highest likelihood of curing um, disease, we have the most data for Ipinevo. Um, and so, you know, now for immunotherapy, we have three options. We have either single agent PD-1, uh, which can work and can work really well in some people. Um, clearly the best tolerated, right? And, um, you know, if I, if I knew who um, single agent PD-1 was going to cure, that's definitely what I would do. Um, second option is Ipinevo, the combination we've used for a long time. A lot of data we know we can cure a good fraction of people with that combination that comes at the cost of side effects. And then Relanevo is kind of like an in-between. It works better than single agent PD-1, maybe not as well as Ipinevo, but with fewer side effects. And so now we have to figure out, you know, how do we take that data and integrate it into our patient care? Some of this is gonna be biomarker driven. Uh, and so there's still more work that we need to do to kind of figure that out. Now, the last bit uh, I wanna talk about is let's say people were treated with PD-1, um, Keytruda, Optivo, uh, and the cancer grew. What do we do? Outside of a trial, what do we do? Um, and this important uh, trial by SWAG, the melanoma group with Dr. Patel runs now, um, uh, helped to answer that question. And so here are patients who had single agent PD-1 who really didn't have a response to that treatment were randomized to either the other immunotherapy, ipilimumab, or the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab, right? To see, do you need the combination or can you just do that one immunotherapy? And in terms of tumor shrinkage, you can see that, and this is a waterfall plot, right? Each bar is a patient. If the tumor shrinks, the bars go down. You want everything to go down. More bars go down for it being evo on the left than on the right. So in terms of tumor shrinkage, it's better for the combination. Primary endpoint of this trial was, again, progression-free survival, duration of disease control, also better for the combination. And so this basically tells us that um, if someone is treated with uh, Keytruda alone, Optivo alone, and the cancer and grows, if we're going to do standard of care treatment, it's going to be Epinevo. So just to kind of summarize, one, does adjuvant immunotherapy work in lymphonode-negative disease? Um, it does, and we can do it. Uh, it's not clear if it's better to treat earlier, though, or wait um, and see if, God forbid, the cancer recurs, treat later. Two, um, do we do IO first or targeted for BRAF mutant melanoma? For, all, for most cases, it's going to be IO first. Three, uh, does uh, the combination of LAG plus PD-1 improve outcomes? And it does. Uh, I do think that we have more data. We do have more data for AP Nevo, but we have to, I think, as a field, figure out how we're going to use this new, new tool that we have appropriately. Um, and, and lastly, in melanoma that grows to single agent PD-1, 
is it better to do ipi nevo or just nevo alone? And here the answer is, is combination. And so I'll just close with, with this slide. You know, there's a lot of work that we're doing, right, to try to understand why does our current immunotherapy not work? You know, how does the immune system, you know, how does the tumor evade the immune system? There are all these mechanisms, right, that have been identified, and this is just a, some of them. Um, and there are trials now kind of trying to address all of these issues. And so, you know, um, I, I just took the kids, the family to Disney. We did the Star Wars thing. You know, the, 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 the force is really strong with the field. We've got an incredible collaboration of um, investigators, clinicians, scientists, patient advocacy groups like AIM and Melanoma. Um, you know, the patients and caregivers are super passionate. And I think, you know, I think we're going to continue to make progress. It's never fast enough. Um, but I, I think we're going to get there. We will get there. All right. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you.